I think my industry has been totally ruined. You know, you end up with a bunch of underfunded pension funds in the end, which someone's going to pay for. It's probably going to be me. All right. Welcome back to Generational Arbitrage. My name is Tyler Neville. I'm sitting down with Harris Kupperman, otherwise known as Cuppy. Cuppy is the CIO and founder of Praetorian Capital. He writes the Adventures of Capitalism blog and also a new product, KEDM, otherwise known as Cuppy's Event Driven Monitor. Um, thanks for joining us, Cuppy. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, really excited to have you. You are one of my favorite macro slash best stock pickers to talk to. I'm honored. Basically because you don't have this like giant compliance department where you give like very meticulous answers. Like you, you have run your fund the way you want to run your fund, which allows you to actually do real things. So can you talk to me about your strategy and how that relates to kind of like your big mega institutional hedge fund? I'm not sure it's a mega institutional hedge fund, but it's a hedge fund and uh, it's had a great year and had a better year last year. It's, it's been a good run for us. Um, no, my strategy, there's three core pieces of the strategy. I mean, uh, what, what I always thought I'd be doing, uh, what I've done in the past is a small cap growth. Uh, unfortunately, Small companies growing faster at stupid valuations. You have you know pre-profit companies with billion-dollar valuations. Anything with any revenue growth is on a multiple of revenue now. You know we used to do multiples on cash flow. So uh, there's just nothing to do in my core world. I have a few of these on the books, but uh, most of what I've been doing is inflection investing, and we're in a special uh, moment in time as the world pivots from deflation to inflation, and ESG basically hijacks the investment process of most firms, where there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, and when I talk about inflection, it's everything from cyclical businesses, uh, secular change in a business, uh, new CEO or new cap structure, whatever it is that sets the business off in some sort of pivot. And we're trying to get there right at the inflection and get there really cheap so you don't take much risk. And then you ride the inflection until it either gets to some value that stops making sense or uh, the thesis doesn't work. Um, and it's worked very well for us, especially with Project Zimbabwe. <laughs> you know, long inflation is the winning trade. Hey guys, I wanted to invite you to a special event we're having from August 11th to the 13th in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. We're going to be talking about the future of the monetary system at a very historic venue too. We're going to have speakers like Mike Green, Lynn Alden, Pippa Malgram, Grant Williams, Dan Tapiero, Jeff Booth, and a variety of others. And maybe you will even have a special guest as well. So uh, come join us. I'm really excited about it and uh, hope you're there. Can you talk about your Project Zimbabwe macro thesis and kind of where we are in markets so people have a little uh, you know, foundation for how you think? Sure. I mean, to me, Project Zimbabwe, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. You know, I, I don't think we're going to go full Zimbabwe here, though. We definitely are putting the initial pieces in place. Um, but no, I... I've looked at inflationary markets and the odd thing about inflationary markets is it's usually some combination of excessive debt, uh, excessive money printing, and usually some imbalances in the economy often caused by government incompetence and overregulation. And what happens is that the government uh, usually ends up printing and stimulating more to cover up their mistakes. And it, it tends to get expressed in the uh, local equity market. Uh, and uh, equities just go straight up. And you know, I, I, I coined this term Project Zimbabwe because a lot of my friends were shorting equities. And uh, I, I just wanted to kind of laugh at them for their stupidity because you cannot be short in Project Zimbabwe. Your only exposure is long and very long. And I think the market's going a whole lot higher. And I remain of the belief that the most undervalued security is the 1,000 call on SPY. I uh, love the anti-consensus. It, it, it's really fascinating because I think if you go look around, you know, everyone's pointing to margin debt being at all time highs. Uh, you know, they, they relate every single chart to the 2000 bubble, et cetera, but they don't take into account the pure amount of dollars that, that got printed and the amount of money that's sitting in, you know, money market funds and treasury bills that are yielding negative against inflation is just astronomical. So like this time looking at the charts is almost like kind of, it's a fool's game instead of just like going long and strong risk risk assets in some ways. Well, but I um, think you could look at 
I mean, there's a lot of historical precedent, and you know, I, I look at everything in historical precedent, and in the end, it's great to look at you know other periods of excessive speculation in the U.S. markets and say you know we're, we're multiple sigmas beyond historical levels, but. Um, you know, if you look at the equity market, you know, devalued by the Fed balance sheet, and that chart's been floating around a lot lately, but I think I was the first one to do that in my blog, uh, you know, basically the month after COVID. <laughs> um, but no, if you look at these uh, other equity markets, you know, Zimbabwe became a speculative bubble because uh, everyone was stuck buying uh, Zim equities because they couldn't get the money out of the country. You know, uh, Venezuela did the same. Uh, Weimar did the same. All of these uh, bubble, uh, hyperinflating economy had the same sort of uh, effects. And yes, people stop doing real work and they stay at home day trading. I think the meme traders are very similar to what happened 100 years ago in Weimar. People stopped showing up to work. They all stood outside the stock exchange and traded stocks with each other. Um, and, you know, when the retail public gets involved, valuation isn't as important because it's more about themes and bubbles than, you know, that valuation it all kind of untethers itself. But, um, no, I would expect uh, more people to be involved. So you'd be at uh, speculative extremes uh, with various metrics. What those uh, speculative extremes do in terms of positioning is they make uh, the market less stable and more volatile. And I'm absolutely sure we're going to have some crazy crashes along the way. I mean... Uh, you, the, the thing you want to do in Project Zimbabwe is you want to be as long as possible without getting shaken out in one of these shakeouts because there will be some really nasty shakeouts. I mean, if you look at Weimar, there were some down 50s and then at Hunter Beggarn again. <laughs> so you really need to be careful and uh, you need to figure out how you want to position it. And, uh, you know, I, I think you're right. There's going to be uh, volatility caused by this sort of positioning. Now, now what do you do? Because like, Everyone's pointing to the savings rates of consumers now after, you know, the government basically gave massive handouts. What do you do with your cash? Like if you're just you're getting eaten up by 5% inflation if you sit in cash and then another 5% of productivity gains that you you lose out on by not being invested. So it's almost like a a 10% loss by sitting in cash. Do you just what sectors will eventually benefit from that money coming off the sidelines. I mean, what benefits is the stuff they can't print. You don't want to be in bonds. <laughs> you definitely don't want to be in cash. Uh, you know, cash is something you do until you figure out what else to do with the money, but you better be fast in uh, you know, reallocating your capital. I like hard assets. I like uh, the things they can't uh, interfere in, in the, in the markets. Uh, you know, everything from real estate to owning physical gold to, I don't know. I mean, go go buy an offshore drilling rig. Uh, they're going to need a lot more of them. Uh, th th there's almost anything you could do as long as the Federal Reserve can't produce more of it or they can't produce it you know, fast. I mean, they could produce unlimited number of EV frauds. Uh, I mean, we just saw this back bubble. They, they, I mean, one worked and six months later, there's a few hundred of these things and none of them will ever have any revenue. Uh, anything like that, you do not want. What you want is something that is really hard to replicate. And if you try to replicate it, I mean, your costs are higher. Like, I, I don't know if anyone should ever produce another, you know, ultra deep water uh, drill, drill ship. Maybe not. Maybe yes, maybe no. But I guarantee you it costs more today than it did 10 years ago because the price of steel is up. The price of labor is up. Uh, you probably need new uh, you know, health and safety equipment, environmental regulations, stuff like that. If the cost keeps going up, then... It's somewhat insulated in a way because the demand is going to come back because the price of oil is going up. So let's dig into that part a little bit because I know you got a lot of thoughts on the ESG narrative. One of the things that I talk about a lot is how when the government gets involved and makes promises or these like thematic things happen in the marketplace, you get almost the opposite intended effect. So like, you know, you get BlackRock talking about their ESG motive. It's almost akin to like cigarette companies, you know, back in the was it the 1950s where we're like, we're concerned about our consumer. You know, we want we want to help you. So, you know, they have this ESG mandate, but there's a lot of side effects that happen. Can you dig into those and what you're seeing specifically? So ESG is this crazy thing to me because I mean, 
at a very basic level, uh, companies that uh, you know don't screw up the environment, they take care of their workers, they have an effective board control over management, they probably should outperform companies that don't do those things. Um, there's a lot of uh, historical data to prove that. Uh, what happened, though, is that people hijacked this process and ESG stopped being about uh, basically protecting the investor and creating value. I mean, it was basically a, a, a data set that you could scan for to find uh, companies that would outperform. Suddenly, ESG meant uh, don't buy coal companies or uh, become an activist investor and make sure your oil company stops drilling for more oil. Like, it, it, it's been so bastardized uh, by special interests that it has no bearing whatsoever on the intended goals. Um, you know, I, I like to think that ESG stands for energy stops growing. Um, you know, every, <laughs> Ever since uh, ExxonMobil had an activist uh, come in there and take some board seats and basically tell uh, one of the biggest oil companies in the world to stop producing oil, I think everyone else kind of stopped and took notice. And I think you have a lot of boards that are genuinely scared. I mean, it's a great job to be a board member. You go to a couple of meetings that you mostly just go golfing and they pay you too much. Um, you know, no one wants to lose that role. So if it turns out that you have to light money on fire building windmills, like that's what they're going to do. Um, and the net result of this, I believe, is that you can see less supply of uh, various commodities. Uh, you know, I I'm mostly focused on oil, but all these commodities, it's going to be harder to get your permits. It's going to be harder to drill. It's going to be harder to build you know, mines. And I think you're also going to have a situation where government regulation gets more intense as well. And, you know, most secular inflations are caused on the demand side, and this one might be caused on the supply side, where supply gets restricted. Um, it was probably a little both, but no, I think ESG is uh, going to make it more difficult to have a supply response as pricing goes higher. And I want to basically be long ESG, but to me, being long ESG means owning coal mines and you know oil wells and you know anything that those assholes want to screw up. <laughs> <laughs> I love the honesty. But you you also mentioned there is an anomaly that's going on in the oil futures market where it's actually in backwardation, right? Where prices today are actually higher than they are out a couple of years. Is, can you explain that phenomenon a bit? So I'm kind of confused myself about it, which is why I think it's an opportunity. Um now, the front of the oil curve is really supply-demand driven uh, in the very short term. And what's happening right now is that we're drawing down two or three million barrels a day of global inventory, and the demand's coming back as the world reopens, and supply's not coming back fast enough. Uh, partly it's because, you know, in the U.S. they're not drilling anymore uh, or less. You know, overseas you have a decline rate in all existing wells. And OPEC, you know, they're kind of constricting supply too. And so what's happening is at the front of the curve, uh, the price is going up. What's interesting is that the back of the curve, you know, go out to 2025, uh, that oil, so the front of the curve is at 75 right now. The back of the curve, uh, four years out is at, uh, 55. And, you know, what it's basically saying is that, uh, investors think that the, this is a short term thing and, uh, the price of oil will go back to where it was for the last couple of years. You know, shale comes back and OPEC comes back and I'm not sure that's possible. Um, you know, anything's possible, but my view is that, uh, you can have to see inflation. Inflation gets expressed in, you know, the cost of labor, the cost of, you know, steel, the cost of all the components of producing oil. Plus, they're probably going to tack on some extra taxes and, you know, carbon, you know, credits and all the other stuff you need to produce a barrel of oil. And that's going to be expressed in, uh, the, the higher price in the future to make it economic for someone to produce this stuff. Plus, you know, oil is one of these funny things where if the price goes up, you use just about as much, you know, the elasticity, uh, you know, doesn't change. And I, I got a feeling if oil goes to 150, everyone's just going to shrug their shoulders and fill up their cars. And so, um, hell, in Project Zimbabwe, the government might give you a uh, pickup truck stimmy <laughs> and, you know, you fill up your car and, you know, they pay for it. Uh, so, no, I, I think you have a situation where oil is going to be higher, and I, I think the futures curve is wrong. I think the curve is somewhat uh, artificially held down right now just because the banks are forcing producers to hedge. And so when they hedge, they have to sell. They sell forward, and there's not a lot of people buying because most people are convinced oil is going back uh, to the 40s and 50s, where it has been basically since uh, 2014. 
Um, I'm going to take the other side of that one. Uh, I think there's a great trade to be there, to be had there. Uh, long 23s and 25s. And I'm, I'm long uh, the futures. I'm long the futures options. I have call spreads. I'm playing it in lots of different ways. But I think that part of the curve is underpriced right now. I mean, I think if anything, that part of the curve should be higher because there should be an imputed uh, couple percent a year inflation added in. And look, before Shell really got going in 2014, oil was 100. Uh, you know, so t- 11 years later in 25, why can't oil be 150? That's just where inflation would be if, if you know, nothing else had uh, affected it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on all that stuff. And I also think from, from a macro perspective, some of the, one of the things I talk about a lot is, you know, the cycle from capital to labor. And we just saw like, even this morning, I was watching CNBC and the Chipotle uh, CEO was giving everybody 20% raises. And so you're, you're going to get this like effect from these mega corporations where if Chipotle does it, then maybe Walmart does it, then Amazon does it. And Everyone does that it. really reallocates the entire pool of buyers. And when you get your labor pool with lots of more dollars, chances are that's going to go to like commoditized goods, right? Like, like oil and, you know, Everything's backed by oil. So. It's going to go everywhere. And at the same time, you have the governments around the world stimulating. I mean, look, you have a bunch of countries locked down. They're, they're hiding from germs. And uh, oil is here at 75. I mean, imagine what happens when the UK unlocks again or India gets going. I mean, look, India is almost uh, at the inflection in, in its S-curve. Uh, China is today. Uh, and the S-curve basically says that once you hit a certain level of per capita income, um, the, the, the per capita usage of uh, energy, especially uh, oil, starts just going straight up. And we're kind of there on 2 billion people, maybe even 3 billion people. I, I would expect uh, that when the lockdowns are done, yet the stimmies are there, especially stimmies that go to consumers, that's going into oil, that's going into food, that's going into uh, you know, construction, that's going into stuff that consumers want. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, pent up demand and price pressure there. And... I think you're in an inflationary cycle. Yeah. So you mentioned housing. Can you talk about the dynamics there? I know, you know, you mentioned previously to me, you know, some some builder stocks, I believe, are poised to really like break out here. Can you talk about the the housing market and how you see it? Yeah, sure. So I'm no expert on the rest of the world. Let's just talk about America. But um You know, you have population growth. It's a constant. Uh, People, when they get married, tend to move out of their apartments or their parents' basement because they have kids. And something of a demographic uh, wave right now, people my age and a bit younger than me that put off having kids about 10 years. And they're suddenly having kids. I know all my friends are. And they're moving out of their one-bedroom apartments and they're getting homes. And uh, because of pricing pressure, they're having to go further away and... Uh, there's going to be a huge boom in new construction. Uh, at the same time, you have, uh, you know, a lot of demographic changes. I think people uh, are increasingly moving out of uh, high cost, uh, you know, northeastern cities or northern cities, uh, California too. They're going to lower cost places to live, and uh, in terms of uh, corporates, they're definitely moving. So, you know, the people are going to go where the jobs are. I think you're going to see just a lot of uh, demographic movement now. Uh, state of Florida has new people every year, but it's accelerating. Um, you want to own Florida. You, you probably don't want to own Chicago. You know, like these are just like demographic uh, trends that have been accelerated because of the differentials in tax, uh, but particularly COVID because work from anywhere or work from home means that you really don't have to be in a $5,000 you know, studio apartment in Manhattan you can own for five grand. You can have a very nice home and build equity in it because you know you have a mortgage on it. So I think you're going to see a lot of people who say, "Hey, this is a better trade for my family. Let's go get you know four thousand feet in uh, Texas somewhere, and my mortgage is less than five grand still." And so even if you take a little bit of a pay cut, you're coming out way ahead. So I, I just think there's a lot of that sort of change, and you, know, you see it in uh, construction numbers, you know, permit numbers, and any metric you want to look at. The, the demand is there for homes and. It's been kind of a 10-year bear market since uh, 08. It started picking up actually a year or two before COVID. But COVID's just accelerated it. And I want to be long the guys making the components. But in particular, I think the guys making the lower-end homes, uh, that's where the demand is. It's below a half-million-dollar home, you know, starter home. 
uh, that's where the shortages are. That's where the demand is. That's where you want to play. Yeah. I'm a, uh, you, it seemed like you were describing my exact life moving from California to Texas in a 4,000 foot square, square home, uh, from a tiny one bedroom that was basically twice the price. But you know what will change when you go to the bigger home? Your energy use is probably triples. Yeah. Yeah, it does. But then you don't get like the homeless guy that, you know, takes a dump on your front doorstep uh, that I used to get weekly over in San Francisco. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's a problem unto San Francisco. But no, I was saying from a macro perspective, as soon as you leave San Francisco and you go to suburbia, uh, not only is your home, you know, it's going to cost more of his bigger to heat and air condition and light, mm-hmm. but you're also going to be driving more. I mean, your energy usage per capita is going up. And I, I see that trend everywhere. You know, gasoline usage in the United States, which had really been in a flat line for like a decade. It really wasn't growing much. I mean, it made new highs by a million barrels uh, this past week. Um, that's a real change, a million barrels. And that's just one country of 300 uh, something million people. Now add that to the rest of the world because I think a lot of people are going to do similar stuff like this. That, that's a huge increase in energy demand. You want to be long energy because this demographic uh, trend, it's going to be driven by energy. It's going to be driven by, you know, industrial metals. You know, think of how much copper is in your home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all yeah, that stuff. Real. Let's, let's move on to uh, the SPAC boom and kind of meme stocks. So I have this this theory that it's kind of driven by Mike Green's kind of like Vanguard and BlackRock are eating the world where, you know, you get this constricted float in a lot of these names because you get inflows from BlackRock and Vanguard that kind of ties up the float. They never sell into a strong market, right? And essentially every incremental dollar that goes into those stocks like AMC, Bed Bath & Beyond, um, you know, uh, GameStop creates that convex blow off top. If you keep Project Zimbabwe going, do you see the, these like meme stock moves in every stock as BlackRock and Vanguard become like an ink, you know, huge, bigger and bigger holder of it? Yes and no. I mean, on the yes side, there's going to be funny, erratic moves because. You have all these overlapping ETFs that have kind of an if-then statement, if inflow, buy more. And a lot of these entities own sort of the same stocks. And, you know, you can have a random ETF with an inflow and another, and the, the Venn diagram of what they own is going to, you know, have a nexus to one or two tickers and they're going to buy every freaking share. <laughs> and what you're going to have is you're going to have a lot of retail guys that recognize that something's going up and they're going to buy it. I mean, look at AMC. The share count's up, what, like 10 times? And it hasn't mattered. I mean, the, the corporate yeah. side, they've done exactly what they're supposed to do. When their shares are overvalued, they raise capital accretively. I mean, in their case, they went from insolvent to maybe having a future. But um, despite all the shares being added, it didn't matter because a number of ETFs had to keep buying. I mean, the Russell 2000, what, what is AMC the second biggest stock in the Russell 2000, it just kept buying the thing. And then the meme guys kept buying it. And I don't know, I think you're going to have some really weird uh, effects because this isn't normal to have an entity just buy Q-sips and not actually think about it. And uh, no, I I think you're one of the reasons I'm so terrified to short anything in Project Zimbabwe is because the fund flows don't make any sense anymore. I mean, Obviously, you could buy an undervalued security where good things are happening, and if nothing happens to the stock, you just buy more. On, on the short side, something that's overvalued could be a hundred times more overvalued. You know, like and so it, it, it's a crazy, scary thing. I mean, in terms of the meme stocks themselves, um, I don't think this is any different from any of these other crazy speculative uh, inflationary bubbles. Uh, you know, they had uh, trade journals. I mean, looking at Reddit is not that different than, you know, the, the tips journals that guys would float around in Germany. They print it in the morning and guys would plant fake stories and retail would buy it. And they'd, they'd print another copy in the afternoon and retail would buy it. And guys just manipulated the market. And I, I assume that sort of thing is going to continue going on. Uh, it, it's just a fact of life. And there's people who are really good at trading these sort of things. I'm not one of them. But, you know, there's people who are making fortunes. And I think a lot of people are losing money. 
Well, I think your performance would uh, not say that you're you're a dog in this this race. But uh, oh, but not in the meme stuff. I mean, what we've done is we've purchased undervalued securities that have uh, strong uh, tailwinds. Uh, mm. We're not buying something that's five times overvalued, hoping it goes twenty times overvalued. Like I, I don't yeah. have any skill. In that. Uh, exactly. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I haven't shorted it. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of which, I want to talk about this dichotomy because you know if your average long short hedge fund is kind of maybe like a little bit. You know, beta neutral, right? It was this big asset gathering feast because you got to charge two and 20 for performance worse than the S&P. And what happens... Isn't that amazing? Is that what? Isn't it stunning? It's stunning. Yeah, These it's, stu it's absolutely crazy. stunning. And there's $4 trillion. Yeah. And most of these funds, I mean, one of the great things about ESG that I don't think is said enough is that the funds have trailed the market for 10 years because in a flat market, they'll probably do okay because they're technically they're beta hedge. So in a flat market, they chose the best longs, the best shorts. Probably it works. I mean, who knows if we haven't had a flat market, it's been straight up, but they've had the wrong strategy for 10 years. They haven't adjusted because either from a marketing standpoint, they couldn't adjust or they just don't know how to adjust. And so these guys 10 years later, rather than saying, wow, we, 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 trailed uh you know vanguard with their what is it like seven basis points or whatever um mm -hmm. you know we, we took our two and 20 haha you guys are suckers instead they said look here's a checklist of esg that consultant produced look how well we're scoring on esg just totally move the goalpost over and set up a new game the game is not any longer to make money it's to have a good esg score and they just yeah. totally changed the game and you know it's like uh, teachers retirement fund of cincinnati and the you know the firefighters of cleveland they're like as they're you know as they're underfunded by 60 percent. here here ken griffin here you go here's well, another he's billion dollars he's making, he's making money that's definitely yeah, true true but you know what's funny is like i i just don't get the whole it's it's like the government is trying every possible way to force investors to to invest in like innovative new growth for the for the future of the economy yet all the political structures want to go to like the most risk averse strategies that don't generate enough yield to fund their pensions so therein lies the 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 opportunity for for funds like you where I feel like you got the macro right and then you dig in and you get the sectors right and it's like consistent outperformance not to toot your horn but like it seems so obvious to me that like this is a smart strategy in in the marketplace yet it people continue to just kind of putz along you know making like three or four percent like completely hedged in a market where you can be up 40, 50% if you pick the right the right stocks, like they did from like 1970 to like 2000, right? And it's just such a funny dichotomy of the, the market institutionally is forced into these strategies, yet in its, there's all sorts of compliance and there's ESG mandates and it's, it's all these politically driven things. And if you just are your own kind of person, managing you know a good book of business you can massively outperform and i'm wondering does that reset at some point when i guess like they get sick of underperforming in in this backdrop how, how does that resolve itself well i mean it will resolve itself because even if you're a pension fund you know you can't count on the government bailing you out i mean they probably will get bailed out but you know, you're the trustee and you look at what's happening and you say, you know, we have liabilities at 7% and we're earning 1% and we're paying 300 bips to earn that 1%. This doesn't work. And, yeah. You know, that's what I'm, my point is they're buying bonds at like a triple C rated bonds at like 4%, which is like after inflation, you're losing money on the, the, the negative yield after inflation on really horrible companies. You know, I just yeah. don't understand how that keeps up. 
Well, that's a different sort of thing because they're just trying to match against their 7% and it's in constant dollars. So that's a bit different. I'm more talking about uh, the uh, hedge fund portfolio managers that um, are in the asset gathering business. And what they've done is they've come to these uh, pensions that don't really know what they're doing, which I feel bad because I, I do think public servants deserve better. Uh, but they come to these guys and they say, look, we're going to you know, choose the best ESG companies that have, you know, 50-50 men and women on the board. We're going to have the Benetton ad for the board of directors. We, you know, we're going to do this ESG thing and just ignore the performance number. That doesn't matter anymore. And for the guys that want performance still, they say, look, you know, you guys can't ever afford to, uh, you know, report a down month. We're going to guarantee you 50 bips a month. Or we're going to do 100 bips a month, you know, to an endowment or something. And we're not going to have any down months. And the way you artificially create that is you, you know, oftentimes it's selling vol or you're out there long and you're buying puts. And, you know, either case, I mean, let's look at both strategies, okay? If you're selling vol, 100% you will blow up eventually. It's just a question of when, but it'll be a very smooth equity curve until you blow up. Um, in, in the other case, you're so effectively long. just to, yeah. to, to dumb that down for like the viewers who aren't like super, you know, super financy, that's essentially just you're picking up nickels in front of a steamroller, right? You're, you're taking a yeah. little bit of yield out of the market and eventually like usually you might slip and fall and get run over by the steamroller. And it's not usually, so the thing is these guys that don't actually know what they're doing, they tend to not just be writing puts on the S&P because that's, that case, you know, as long as you have enough cash to get assigned, you're going to be fine. They're more often doing something really complex. So when it blows up, it really blows up. You know, they're short, like out of the money VIX calls or something just crazy that no one should ever do. Uh, because, you know, some, you know, financial services person sold them the dream. Uh, but what most of these guys are doing is they're long the market and then they're uh, buying protection against their own book. And the net result is that you end up with a smoother equity curve, but you're going to underperform the market because you're buying protection every month in some way. And both of these strategies are just really dumb. When you look at a you know a investor that has a multi-decade or you know in the case of an endowment, you know multi-generational sort of liability, why are you so worried about monthly uh, you know liquidity, monthly you know performance? But these guys are coming in, they're saying, we're going to make sure that you're never having down months or your worst down month all year is going to be 3% or whatever the, the you know, they, they tell the endowment. And then they artificially create this thing that doesn't do what the endowment wants. Um, and then they charge a ton of fees so that the endowment can never, you know, prosper. I think my industry has been totally ruined. Uh, you know, I, I think if you're going to go out there and you're going to charge 2 and 20, you better beat the market and you better beat the market by a lot. You shouldn't be beating it by 200 bips. You should really be crushing it. You should be doing something that really adds value and shows outperformance. And that doesn't mean you have to outperform every month or even every year, but over rolling three year periods, you should dramatically beat the market after all your fees. Otherwise you're destroying value in a way. And uh, I think a lot of people in our industry are destroying value. Um, it's so easy right now to make money because uh, these guys are dumping anything non ESG. All you have to do is buy coal stocks. You know, it's not even very difficult. But there's a lot of things you can do in the markets that make money that institutional investors can't or won't do. And I'm not even talking about ESG. Uh, you know, it's the proverbial, and this has been going on for 20 years. It's the proverbial stock that, uh, oh, it's a next year story. And no one can own a next year story. What does that even mean? It means next year's earnings would be better than this year. So you just buy it and maybe it really takes 12 months before the stock goes up. I don't care. I'm, I'm working on a rolling three-year basis. I don't have to care about what next month looks like because I've known, I mean, I have people to report to, but as long as my numbers are good on my own metric, which is rolling three years, I don't care which of those three years it happens. It just has to happen. And I think a lot of people look at these sort of situations and they say, we can't own that because of this. We can't do this because of this because they artificially put themselves in this weird style box that forces them to underperform, you know, and you're going to be destined to underperform. Um, and the endowments are the ones paying for this and the customer is always right. I, I don't really fault some of my friends. I mean, in the end, your, your goal is to raise a bunch of money and earn yourself some fees. If the customer wants it, you just give them what they want. But I think there's this whole mindset problem in our industry. And, you know, you end up with a bunch of underfunded, underfunded pe uh, pension funds in the end, which someone's going to pay for is probably going to be me. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I feel like uh, it'll. Judging from how how ahead of the curve you are, it'll less be you and more so, you know, your average uh, Joe that works your your normal job who gets eaten. No, but the government will bail that. The government will bail out the pension funds. I mean, you can't have a bunch of voters that suddenly, you know, can't retire because, you know, they're probably suing all the hedge fund managers to blame us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's really, this is why I, you know, I started the podcast is there's so many social undercurrents and political problems at this juncture where it's not even like a free market anymore because they just, you know, stir up demand in certain parts of the uh, the, the certain sectors of the economy. So, so what do you see for the second half of the year? Um, I want to press you on a couple things, which is, you know, Bitcoin, the market, um, and where, you know, your average investor can kind of like stay ahead of the game. So I think the back half of the year is going to look like the, a lot like the first half of the year. There's going to be too much money printing, too much stimulus. I mean, the government's already said that every time we have a down data point, there'll be another stimmy. Uh, you know, uh, in Congress, they're talking about another trillion dollar uh, infrastructure bill. I mean, do you remember when a trillion dollars was a lot of money? Like, they do one of these each quarter now. Um, I'm like shocked. I, I quantify it sometimes to people, whereas like $800 billion was the subprime bailout. And a trillion dollars is like, they're, it's just like, you know, a trillion. Let's throw a trillion at it. And I'm like shocked we've gotten to this point. It, it, it's terrifying. And that money, it, you know, it gets into the system, but then it kind of like percolates and bounces around uh, with, a, with about a year left, really, in the economy. I mean, we're just starting to digest all the PPP loans. Um, and so, no, I think it's going to be very inflationary. I think uh, the government's already said that anytime it's a down month, uh, they're going to step in. Uh, I think you just could be as long as you possibly can with uh, the proviso that there will be a day where out of the blue, Jay Powell will have a press conference and he'll tell you that the market's overheating or inflation's too hot or whatever his you know metric is. And they're going to do some uh, QT. They're going to raise rates and the market's going to have a heart attack. Um, my fund is going to be down 30 percent that day. I'm just absolutely sure about it because we're long inflation. Um, and you can go into the market every day knowing that one day you'll be down 30, which for me is, that's going to happen every year or two. Uh, you know, we have uh, net cash, you know, we're not levered. Uh, you know, we're designed to survive these so sort of uh, shocks because I know they're coming. Or you can get taken out of the game because you're not ready for that. Or you could be like these pension funds that had that they're down 300 bips instead of 30% like me and they all get redeemed. <laughs> um, but no, I know there's going to be a bad uh, day coming and you can just set up your life and, you know, educate your own clients and explain, you know, you don't get the ups like we've been having for the last two years without expecting some volatility. And, you know, the trade-off is we're going to have a down one. And I expect that down one. I just don't know when. And because I don't know when, I can't plan for it. So we're just going to be uh, flexible, liquid, have plenty of excess uh, liquidity and cash in the balance sheet. And we're probably going to be the ones taking advantage of other people. But it's coming. Uh, but until it comes, we're going straight up. Or at least maybe not, you know, meme stocks, maybe not fraud stocks, but the things I own, which is uh, basic materials, uh, cyclicals, uh, energy. You know, I think my stuff's going up. Uh, of course, I think my stuff's going up. <laughs> In terms of the, the, the assets you asked about, um, you know, Bitcoin, I don't really know. I don't have a, a view. We got long in my fund at 9200 uh, last yeah. year. I wrote Sorry. Can I preface it? Because you really, you really traded Bitcoin better than anyone that I saw out there. Not, you know, you really did. You, you, you understood the dynamics. You wrote about it, you know, the GBTC, that whole phenomenon, and then you kind of felt the frothiness and got out. Yeah, I did. Uh, I got lucky. I don't know. I mean, it worked. I don't. I don't want to take too much credit. I got lucky. I. I, I mean, structurally, I'm. Bullish inflation. I felt like inflation would be expressed in crypto. Um, you know, I, I made the right trade. A lot of my friends are sitting there in gold, making no money. Uh, I made the right trade, uh, and I found a spot in the chart where I felt like I could risk a few hundred to see what happened, and it just hit escape velocity and kept going. Uh, I recognized that grayscale was driving a lot of this, 
And when uh, Grayscale uh, went to, you know, a discount to NAV, it, the feedback uh, mechanism stopped. And, uh, you know, the stock just didn't feel very punchy anymore. And at, at the same time, you know, all the meme, you know, shit coins, whatever you guys want to call them, they went crazy. And uh, people on my FinTwit feed that used to make fun of crypto were suddenly long. And, you know, Mia Khalifa was a crypto expert. And I kind of said to myself, this is a little odd. This, this looks like a thinning stuff. And I don't want to be timing it to the very end, you know, eighth inning's good enough for me. And I had an exit around 58 thou. Uh, you know, I, I didn't go short though. I probably should have, cause I felt like it was going to crap. Uh, I've traded a few for some bounces and I've done well, but for the most part, I think uh, the top is in for this cycle. And I think there's going to be some great trading rallies and there's some people who are really good at that. I'm, I, I've been lucky more than good. Uh, but I think you're going to need a reset of the cycle. I think there's a lot of uh, guys that really don't uh, believe in Bitcoin. They don't want to be long. They saw something going up and they got greedy. All their friends were making money and they bought it. And now I would say this crypto cycle is very different. So the first cycle was true believers, innovators. The second cycle was retail, buying something that was going up, not really understanding it. And this third cycle was uh, hedge funds and pension funds and you know, all sorts of people like Fidelity that would never normally want to buy this sort of thing for their clients that bought it. And now there's a bunch of senior citizens that don't know what it is, but it's down and they're probably going to take a tax loss at your end. And I think you're going to need to wade through a lot of that selling before it can reset and, you know, basically cycle the coins back into believers. And so, no, I think it's not something I want to own right now. I want to be an energy. I think uh, there's a crisis brewing there. It's going to make uh, Jimmy Carter look like an amateur compared to what Larry Fink and uh, Biden are doing. I want to be there. <laughs> I mean, uh, very interesting dichotomy. I, uh, I'm still long, you know, Bitcoin and a bunch of crypto, expecting it to be the inflationary asset. Um, but yeah, you make some really solid points. Maybe the better risk reward at this venture is, is the oil stuff and the highly inflationary uh, commodities. So, Cuppy, it's been a pleasure, man. I uh, hope you can come back uh, in a couple months to, to see how this plays out. Happy to come on anytime. And yeah, I appreciate you inviting me.